For decades, American political satirist P.J. O'Rourke has stuck his thumb in the eye of the establishment, writing for big circulation magazines such as The Atlantic and Rolling Stone, and in his many books covering topics as broad as cars and politics. But in this astonishing era, where the U.S. has a president as, well, let's say unconventional as they come, what does this libertarian crave? P.J. O'Rourke's new book answers that question. It's called A Cry from the Far Middle, Dispatches from a Divided Land. He is the H.L. Mencken Research Fellow at the Cato Institute, and P.J. O'Rourke joins us now from South Central New Hampshire. P.J., it's great to have you on TVO again. How are you doing? I'm fine, and it's uh, I'm I'm glad to be on that channel. I, I unfortunately can't be in your country. The border is closed. So I hear. Normally, about, yeah, yes. <laughs> Normally, this time of year, I'm in New Brunswick. I, I've been going since about 1980 or or 81. I've been going every year to New Brunswick to um, hunt ruffed grouse and woodcock. Well, we'll, we'll do the next best thing we can, which is a chat through cyberspace like this. I have to no. tell you, I have never experienced an election like the one you folks are currently having in which more people have said the very fate of the republic is at stake. I hear that a lot. Do you agree with that? No, not really. I mean, um, uh, I can understand how people feel that way, but I think it's a, I think they're sort of overdoing the, uh, the, the, the public memory is short. I hear a lot of, uh, oh, America has never been so divided. Well, you know, I'm a child of the 1960s. I can recall when we were much more violently and angrily divided uh, than we are now, when the rioting uh, in our cities was much worse, the protesting much more demonstrative, I suppose you might say, the police reaction to it uh, uh, um, uh, worse uh, even than the police reaction to what's been going on, et cetera. Uh, and... Uh, um, uh, forget the 1960s. Uh, think back to the 1860s when America had this thing called a civil war. You know, however divided we may be in the United States, and we are plenty. Um, Fort Sumter is not taking any incoming from Confederate forces at the moment. Uh, no, but it won't. Look, it won't look like that. And you, 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 and I have both heard a lot of smart people say that uh, you, you know, if the wrong thing happens, and they can define that however they want. America could descend into civil war, and it won't be the gray versus the blue. It'll be sort of the Michigan militia versus the local police force, that kind of thing. Can you imagine that? Uh, I can imagine it, but I, I don't foresee it uh, really as, as turning out quite that. Uh, I, I have been so wrong about the fortunes of Trump, starting with, you know, when he began making noises about the, the presidency years ago. I've been so consistently wrong about him that I have my have had my Delphic Oracle uh, uh, license uh, uh, pulled. But uh, nonetheless, I, I, I think there's going to be a decisive victory for, for Biden. And then I think that the vast majority of Trump voters will um, support that, acquiesce to that. We have a uh, America has a rather amazing tradition, uh, even in the most divisive of political uh, uh, presidential races, of accepting the outcome. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that is uh, we're not an intensely political nation. And I think we share this with you, actually. I mean, um, America and Canada, um, we're, we're, we're busy countries. Uh, people have a lot of individual liberty and a lot of individual responsibility, and that means we've got a lot to do. We don't have that European luxury of sort of madly focusing upon, uh, upon politics. And, and we, we, we both know that when politics have come too much to the fore in our societies with the uh, 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 Quebec independence movement, for instance, I, I can remember the terror attacks and so on that went on with that, um, with the Vietnam War in the United States. Uh, none of us have really fond memories in our, your country or ours of, of, of excessively political periods. Well, having said that, you do describe that the country that you're in right now is mired in, quote, idiot populism and hooligan partisanship. And I guess I want to know who are the idiots and who are the hooligans? <laughs> yes. Well, they take turns, don't <laughs> they? <You know? laughs> I mean, we have plenty of idiocy to go around and plenty of hooliganism to go around. And of course, you know, there is our, we do have a sort of violent history as a country. This is, um, um, uh, this is where our, our, our two nations really are, uh, uh, are, are, are very different. 
Uh, and yes, one always worries, but oh God, yeah, it, it's you know, it's a terrible thing. The amount of tribalization that's gone has gone on. Instead of having a good old-fashioned argument about the issues, you know, and there are lots of issues to argue about. In any large democracy, is going to have like lots of fights about allocation of resources and emphasis and uh, which laws and which kind of rule of law we're, we're going to have. Uh, we take that as a given. Uh, but but it's degenerated into this sort of kitchen sink fight, you know. Um, I would compare it to uh, anyone who's been in a long-standing relationship of any kind knows this kind of argument. Um, it starts out with a uh, uh, a, a little tiff about uh, re, re, re slip covering the sofa. You know, I mean, should should it be tartan plaid? Should it be cabbage roses? Um, and somehow or other, the, the 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 argument gets a little out of hand after that, and gets a little more heated and. And pretty soon it's about, you know, how you leave the uh, 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 wet towels on the bed and I drop my socks all over the floor. And from there it goes to that time in 1996 where I was flirting with a girl at a party. And uh, and from there it goes to, I hate your mother. I've always hated your mother. I've never said it aloud. You know? and, uh, and America has allowed our natural political arguments, which are a good and healthy thing to have, to g degenerate in, into this kind kind of fury, I'm assuming we'll get over it. If we don't get over it, it you, you'll, you can leave the United off United States. Well, thankfully, you've given us a prescription forward, or I guess you've given your fellow Americans a prescription forward. And uh, here's a quote from the book which explains it all. We need a political system, you write, that isn't so darn sure of itself. It's time for the rise of the extreme moderate. Power to the far middle. Let's bring the wishy and the washy back together, along with the namby and the pamby and the milk and the toast. The extreme moderate's non-negotiable demand? Negotiation. We won't compromise until we see some compromising. We want political action or inaction. It depends. Now, <laughs> I, I can tell you, as a Canadian, I kind of love this sentiment. Are you, by any chance, becoming a little more Canadian? Yeah, well, I was born right on the border, practically. I was uh, born and raised in Toledo, Ohio. Our big radio station was CKLW. We got television. We got Canadian television. Um, what was that wonderful series that you, that you had about long Canada Highway Shocker? I, uh, I remember watching that avidly. It seems, uh, seemed very exciting to be trucking across Canada in those days. This is 1950s. So, so, so yeah, I suppose I am becoming. And, and, you know, you are a bit of a beacon of light on uh, our, our North Star in a certain ways because, uh, like, like us, you are a deeply divided nation. I mean, you have the whole Anglophone, Francophone question, plus a, a very diverse population uh, in, 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 in Canada. And um, you managed to, in, in, to my eyes at least, you managed to work it out uh, in, a, in, a, in a less less heated and more civilized fashion. No, in fact, we just passed the 50th anniversary of um, of only the second time in Canadian history that a politician was murdered uh, because of some political action group. This was the uh, separatist FLQ. So 50, oh, yes. it's, it's been 50 years. And uh, I, I, I suspect Canadians are kind of proud of the fact that we tend to figure things out without killing each other in the main. You live, on the other hand, in a country that very much likes to divide itself, or as you've described it, between the coastals and the heartlanders. And um, it, there doesn't seem to be much of a call between those two groups for compromise and inaction. Are you speaking, therefore, to a vanishingly smaller group of Americans who kind of like the food fight the way it is? No. Well, for the sake of my paycheck, let's hope not. But yes, probably. You know, yeah, I do feel a little lonely out in the middle of the road, um, uh, you know, sort of out in, on, on the double yellow line in the middle of the night with morons passing me on the left at 140 miles an hour and and, and idiots passing me on the right and uh, is spraying gravel all over the place and flying their big Confederate flag from their pickup truck. Um, so I hope I'm speaking to it. I hope there are a few people that feel this way out there. Uh, we have come to a divide in the United States, and I'm sure it's not completely incomprehensible to you, uh, between a certain sort of coastal elite, mostly on the West Coast and East Coast. Well, they're scattered through our university towns and our sort of hip places like uh, Austin, Texas, and so on. Uh, they, they're, 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 they're everywhere, and they're, they're, they're the kind of people 
um, um, God love them. Uh, they're the kind of people who know all about locavore and they know about GMO free and they know about vegan and they know about uh, 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 fair trade and and uh, uh, and all of this, but they don't know hay from straw, <laughs> and this aggravates uh, uh, ordinary Americans living in the in the physical world who, who do know hay from straw. And, you know, the results of this divide are, are bad. I mean, it leaves the coastal elite trying to sip their lattes through a blade of hay. And it leaves the, um, uh, 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 you know, it leaves the, the, the heartland Americans uh, stuffing a scarecrow full of straw and putting it in the White House. <laughs> well, I'm kind of cu curious as to how you see yourself, because as you point out, you're from Toledo, Ohio, which screams heartland. But on the other hand, you know, you are a New York Times best-selling author, which screams coastal elite. So, which are what, what do you think you are? Well, I I, I I am a coastal elite who lives on a farm, and my my chickens can tell you just how bad a farmer I am. <laughs> <laughs> and a quick inspection of my vegetable garden will show you that. Yeah, so I don't know. I suppose I'm I'm a I, I, I do know that 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 if you try to feed the horses uh, uh, straw instead of hay, that you're going to be in a certain amount of trouble. But but on the other hand, of course, you're right. You know, I mean, I I, I came east to go to school, and I stayed east, and um, and and there I remain. But I you know I don't think that should 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 that that kind of divide should properly be there. I honestly think, and like I say, I'm not asking everybody to. Um, um, come together in a group hug and sing Kumbaya. You know, I, 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 I'm simply asking us to get to get back to substantive arguments and to get away from from this uh, identification um, um, uh, and, and, and and hatred of the other that we seem to be going through right now. There is plenty of that, and I wonder whether it's exacerbated by the way in which you choose your presidents, namely not through direct election actually, but through the electoral college where you get these anomalies where a George W. Bush gets fewer votes but win the, wins the election, where a Donald Trump gets fewer votes but wins an election. Are you tired of the Electoral College? Oh, no, not at all. No, I actually think the Electoral College is quite important. Um, uh, we're a very big, uh, 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 diverse in the old-fashioned sense of the uh, of the world. Very, very different regions of the United States are are very different from each other. Again, can, any Canadian can 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 understand this comparison. Atlantic Canada is very different from Quebec. Quebec is very different from Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Columbia. Uh, you know, on on on, uh, on the west coast, uh, British Columbia, of course, is is much a, a different thing yet. Your California, I suppose, uh, is that uh, our system, the Electoral College, gives place as well as people a vote. Uh, it's interesting to look at the numbers of, um, if you take the San Francisco metropolitan area, that includes as many people as all of Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and I think Idaho put together. So this little group of people, you know, who can barely find their way through the fog to Berkeley, um, would be in charge of, of of this vast area were it not for a sort of devolved electoral um, uh, um, system that, that that we've had since the creation. And you know, can Canadian provinces have have a considerable latitude, uh, uh, their their own power separate from the from the Canadian federal government. So I don't think it's that hard to understand, really. No, we have the same thing actually in the province of Ontario, where we give extra seats to Northern Ontario, which has very few people, but but we want to make sure that they have an adequate voice in the Ontario legislature. And New Brunswick, where you spend so much time, has a guarantee in the Constitution that it has a, a floor of seats it can't go below, even though their population doesn't mandate it. So, yeah, we do right. get that. But, but, comma, how many more elections can you have where the gut, where the person who wins doesn't actually get the most votes before people start saying this is crazy this has got to go? Oh, no, I, I think the system will endure. Uh, when you when you look at 
most of the election figures, it turns out nobody got over half. I mean, it's, it, it, it usually is usually the case. There are some third parties and some write-ins and so so on that, that, that keep it from ever. And we're really here. We're talking about two. We're not talking about two political parties in the sense of like the Nazi Party and the Communist Party or something. I mean, America doesn't have a, a very firm basis in, in in party politics. I mean, you cannot obviously from from some of the people. Uh, <laughs> I'll name no names, but one of them's right in the White House. Uh, obviously, you can't be expelled from an American political party. And if you donate so much as a nickel to either a Democrat or Republican, you find yourself you're a member of that party forever, uh, whether you'd like to be. You mean you have to change your address and all your contact points to get rid of them. Um, the uh, uh, Really, what you do, what you have in the United States is two broad categories uh, of thought, one, one, one category is that, uh, you know, government should fix the problem. Um, that's sort of one category of thought. The other category of thought is that government is the problem. Um, and, you know, oddly enough, you, you, you can hold both of these ideas in your mind at the same time without cognitive dissonance, without driving yourself crazy. All of us have, have, have sat in government offices filling out reams of bump. Uh, in order to get some benefit, to which we're perfectly well entitled, and which we should have, and uh, uh, and, and and which we're glad that the government provides, but you know, you're sitting there for hours at a time, waiting in line and filling out forms to register your 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 boat trailer, uh, and you, you can be at that moment. I mean, thankful that the that trailers are safe and registered, and that we have a, a motor vehicle department to make sure that. No more idiots are on the road. So, and there, it, usually in the United States, there's a very considerable overlap between these two points of view. Uh, lately, the Venn diagram has been separating, you know, and they, they, the the two points of view haven't 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 had much in common. But that comes and goes uh, uh, in the United States. I'm hoping it'll go. Well, notwithstanding all of that, your country likes to think of itself, I think, as an exceptional country. And um, I'm going to read an excerpt of yours, which asks the question, how much longer? Our country, you write, was founded by the delusional and the crazy, populated by the desperate and the unwilling, motivated by most of the seven deadly sins, and is somehow the richest and most powerful nation on earth ever. Having said all that, I wonder how pessimistic you are about America remaining that. Uh, I'm not. I'm really not. I mean, I think that the, uh, despite all the noise that has been made about immigrants, um, uh, I suggest in the book, actually, that if you have that sort of opinion about immigrants, why don't you wear it on a sign around your, hanging around your neck? See how you get treated by cab drivers and wait staff uh, uh, and uh, the people who change your bed linens at hotels and so on. In fact, see how you get treated by your own immigrant grandparents. Um, uh, uh, if you hate immigrants so much, it's one of the things that's kept America lively and booming. And uh, yes, it, it is an odd situation. We are a country that was uh, settled basically by the off scourings of uh, first Europe. Uh, uh, people, you know, desperate to escape poverty and, uh, and also a certain sort of bunch of religious nuts. They, they were there too. Um, and then, of course, there were a large portion of Americans who were dragged here in slavery uh, totally against their will. Uh, and and there's another large portion of Americans who who I don't think my family, for instance, we came here not 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 because of the American dream. We came here because there was nothing to eat in Ireland. We, we came here during the famine and we actually came across Canada. We came by um, uh, 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 we came by wagon train across Canada to Michigan uh, to work as lumberjacks. And not only was my family immigrant, but I have a feeling that probably also being illiterate, uh, they it was probably about 10 years before they even knew what country they were in. Hmm. Well, you do write an imaginary inaugural address for your imaginary ideal president. I've never heard a president say this, but I think it might be neat to hear it one day. And your new president would say, quote, my job isn't all that important. Are you really sure you want to be an American? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I do well, you know. I mean, born and bred in the bone, so what can I do? But uh, no, I, you know, I actually very proud to 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 be an American. Proud that 
the weird group of people that wound up here have done such a fine job of making the place, you know, so so rich and so free and 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 and, and so powerful, largely for good, not always for good, but you know, can't can't not, no one's perfect. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I do. I, I would like presidents to sort of stand down a little bit and say, look, this is a free country. You know, I've got I've got 380 million bosses. You know. Uh, you are the shareholders. I, I, I'm merely management. You know, and there, 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 there are limits to what I can do, and actually, I'm also tasked with doing what you want me to do, which, of course, is a confusing task because there are a lot of you, and you want different things, and it's never going to be perfect for anyone. And uh, I, 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 I'm not one. Of the, I'm not some magical, mythical, uh, 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 you know, k- sacred king. Uh, you know, who who performed all the good things in in life and society, and who's to blame for all the bad things? I mean, that's that's not how a modern democracy works. Well, let's finish up in our last minute here by pointing out that in 2016, you did vote for Hillary Clinton for president on the grounds that quote she's wrong about absolutely everything, but she's wrong within normal parameters, <laughs> which is uh, that's a that's a very amusing vote of confidence here. I do need to know who you're voting for this time and why. Well, um, uh, we don't have to tell, you know. We do have a secret ballot, but uh, I'll probably follow the same general thing. It's a little bit um, hard for me to say, even this close to the election. Uh, uh, I voted for Hillary because New Hampshire was a swing state, so it was important in that, what we were talking about earlier, the, 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 the uh, electoral college. And I did feel, you know, that uh, uh, Trump worried me, frightened me, he continues to do so. So if we, if we remain a swing state, I suppose I'll have to hold my nose and vote for Biden. I saw a wonderfully honest yard sign the other day. I wanted to, if it weren't for the pandemic, I would have, I, I, I would have rung the doorbell and hugged the people who put it out. It said, settle for Biden. <laughs> That's a good sign. Well, I think Hillary won last time by 0.4 of 1% of the vote. It was real close. Last poll yeah. I checked had Biden up by 12. So I think if you go with Biden, you're going to be on much more than the winning side this time. Winning in a breeze. Well, you know, we'll see. You know, I, I don't know if there really is a winning side. The winning side may take years to develop. Uh, uh, that, that may be, uh, we may be all losers this time around. Oh, I hope not. I really hope not. <laughs> we've, had a, we, we've had enough of that. Uh, yeah. Pat, Patrick Jake, it is always good of you to join us on our airwaves. And a cry from the far middle, dispatches from a divided land is your latest. And uh, I'll say the same thing I said to you last time you were on this program, which was many, many years ago. You know, for a smart guy, you're very, very funny. So thanks and keep <laughs> writing. <laughs> well, you're, you're welcome, and I have but little choice to keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.